Welcome back, welcome back. We have another class tonight. Uh, Crypto Kaplan says his apology sends his apologies. He is not able to make it tonight. So we're going to continue on with our discovery of coins as we work through the first initial coins. I know a lot of people know a lot about the kind of top tens, but we're just covering all our bases. So tonight we're going to do a deep dive on the Solana blockchain. We're going to see what's what with all things Solana. You can feel free to join my screen. Make some quick class announcements before we start. I have closed down the last Kahoot challenge and will open up the next one tomorrow. You can get that in. Top 10 will receive XP drops. And some of you are really grinding your way up the uh, charts. I am now number four <laughs> on, uh, uh, on this Discord. So congrats to those of you that took place one, two, and three. Uh, we still are doing the Ledger Nano giveaways, so feel free to get those invites in. The hard date for that is April 29th. We will tally up the leaderboards, see who that is not staff has the most invites, and winner winners will receive hard wallets. So we'll jump right in now to the Solana. Solana Network is a public blockchain using programs. They call them programs. That's just in place of dApps or smart contracts on Ethereum. But this is a rival layer one blockchain to Ethereum. Layer one, you could just think of as blockchain. Just a group of boxes that get filled up with transactions until they're filled to the brim and then the next block. So Solana, last time we talked about Ethereum as a layer one blockchain. Solana is the, uh, was created with the idea of being a rival to Ethereum. It was founded in April of 2019 and it uses smart contracts just like Ethereum does, a little bit different, we'll get into it but it claims to be faster and cheaper than Ethereum, which it does so at some expenses. So we'll talk about the ups and downsides. The founder of Solana is Anatoly Yakovenko. That's him right there, that handsome gentleman. He's a computer scientist who started off at a junior position for Qualcomm and very quickly worked his way up to a senior position um, before leaving and joining in with Dropbox. While at Dropbox, he met his co-founder and uh, together they started the Solana Foundation, Solana Labs, and built the network with the main goal in mind of being cheaper and faster than Ethereum. We'll compare Solana speeds versus Ethereum seeds speed side by side in a little bit. Instead, so, so uh, Ethereum uses Solidity, the Solidity coding language, which we have classes on every Monday night if you'd like to learn to read or write in Solidity. Solana uses Rust, which is a little bit more of a complex language. It's a little bit higher of a learning curve. We will not um, have any Rust classes here at Knowledge Chain, at least for the foreseeable future. But if you'd like to learn, I will drop this link in chat. And this is, they call it the book. Uh, this is how to learn Rust. If you are a crazy person and want to do that, I would highly, highly recommend you learn a more basic language first. But you can feel free to check out a little bit of the code if you'd like. This is what it looks like. This is actual Rust code right here. So as I was saying, uh, Solana was created essentially just for the purpose of rivaling Ethereum. And we can look in the first two columns here to see what their transactions per second are. This number changes. Um, I've seen this at 
30,000, I've seen this at 40,000, I've seen this at 50,000, I've seen this at 65,000, it's pretty, pretty high. TPS is transactions per second, or how many transactions happen every second. And you can see it is incredibly higher than Ethereum's. You can also look at the average fee per transaction and notice it's a fraction of a penny. While you're paying in Ethereum gas, or that GUE that we were talking about, Solana Gas is still paid in their native token called SOL. And you can see it's extremely cheap to send money across the Solana network. Just like Ethereum has validators on the network that approve those transactions, people that have given their hard-earned Ethereum um, to validate the network, to secure the network, they therefore have the incentive of being truthful on that network. For the same reason Solana has validators, their validators are a little bit different. They call them clusters. They're in groups of 150 validators each called clusters. There are currently over 17,000 total validators, and they work on what's called a super minority, meaning that there's a um, small amount of heavier investors that are the super minority. We don't have to go too deep in on this, but you can just know that their validators are put into clusters and that they are constantly trying to attract more validators. But again, we'll get more deep into this in a moment. Solana does have block explorers, just like Ethereum has Etherscan. So first I want us to go ahead and look at SolScan. So I'm gonna go ahead and in the chat, I'm gonna drop the link to SolScan. And I'm gonna ask that every, oh, that is going to Rust, the book again. It's called the book, by the way, for Rust, because it's like a, um, everything you'd ever want to know about Rust. So it's wholeheartedly referred to as the book, but there's SoulScan. And SoulScan works very similar to etherscan.io. Very basic on this front page. We have a lot of really good information, including popular collections and NFTs on the Solana network. We can look at the DeFi dashboard and see the amount of total value locked in different protocols or different programs on the network. I should say programs, right? Because that's the right language or uh, uh, words to use on, on the Solana blockchain. And we can look at the amount of volume that is traded. We can also look at the top automatic market makers, autom automatic, automated money makers by volume. We'll talk a little bit about Radium especially, but Serum and Orca are other options as well. We can also scroll down and see the average transactions per second as they are updated. And again, we're now looking and seeing that, wow, this is even more than what that chart that I showed was before. So right now in the chat, just like you normally would, by the way, you would drop in your contract address here. So right now in the chat, I'm going to go into my wallet. And I am going to drop my wallet address. And I would like the first three people that can tell me how much soul is in that wallet. Yes, the, my password is always 1234 for anybody that wants to help themselves to my Solana. First three people to tell me how much soul I currently hold in that wallet will get an XP drop. I've dropped my address, which you'll notice, by the way, that MetaMask addresses or addresses on the Ethereum network start with an OX. That is not the case for Solana network. Nice, Lolly. Nice, Dr. K. And nice happy meal. Nice job. Yes. 
So if you were to just take this, copy it, and put it into here, we have some very basic information. What is very cool is that you can see, um, we'll get into actually a little bit more of, of this. But very easy to see. Boom, there's the account balance. We do have a more in-depth, much more in-depth blockchain explorer. If we're back on my screen now, this is called Solana Beach. Solana Beach shows me where in the world all of these validators or clusters are and which cluster is up next to fill the block. I can scroll down and I can see the current trans, uh, TPS, transactions per second. I can see the total number of transactions that have happened over the network. I can see the circulating supply or the amount of coins that are circulating of the two, 520 million, 64% or 333.4 million, whereas actively staked are 392. That's not too shabby right there, pretty good ratios. You can see the recent transactions and recent slots. If we scroll up here though, we can go over to the validators tab. And if it will load, we can actually see which validators have which things staked and how much the percentage of that cumulative is. We can see here that Kraken, that's the symbol for the Kraken exchange, right there, um, that they are a validator, they have a large amount of soul that they have um, staked and are now validating the network. Furthermore, we can move over to the next tab. And here is where we can see all of the transactions as they pour through. I'm gonna go ahead and put in my wallet again. And bada bing, bada boom. You can see my wallet nice and easy. If you are going to use Solana Beach, this is a much more in-depth look at the Solana blockchain. But you can see all my previous transactions. You can see my tokens, what tokens I have, etc. So Solana Beach is just another example. More in-depth. I would recommend using SoulScan for your daily, and if you really want to check the fundamentals of the network, you can go ahead and look at Solana Beach. I do not use this as commonly as I would um, SoulScan. This is much more like an ether scan. All right, let's keep moving. Solana does have a lot of downsides. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Since there has been so much emphasis put on speed and um, cheap transaction costs, it is considered very centralized around that super minority or that small group of validators, the big, big boys and the validators clusters. Um, due to that lack of security, they've actually had many outages on the network due to DDoS attacks or distributed network. Um, I'm blanking, DDoS. Distributed denial of service attack, which you can think of as just a 51% attack. But basically they're just overwhelming the network with too many bot transactions. We can look at statussolana.com. There are many examples of this. And we can see very clearly when those outages occurred. We can see that in the middle of January, as things kind of hit their peak with the beginning of NFTs for Solana, that things started having a lot of outage problems. We have one that was even 18 hours long. I'm gonna post this in chat and I'm gonna ask the first three people, can you tell me when the before January of this year, can you tell me before January of this year, when was the last time that Solana went down? It wasn't in December. I see December's all green. I see November's all green. 
Oh, I don't want to give away the answer. Dr. K, very nice. September 21st of 2021. I see a big major outage for 17 hours as the network itself was DDoSed and taken down. Most other projects refer to having a 100% uptime, meaning that the network itself has never gone down, has never had a problem. Uh, Solana cannot make that claim. Although it can claim to be faster and cheaper, it cannot claim to be more secure. So next week, we're going to have Crypto Aaron on, who is going to do a deep dive into all the different exchanges we can look at when buying different coins, what wallets are best for what things, what exchanges are best for what things, where the arbitrage opportunities are. We're going to get into all that next week with Crypto Aaron. But for this week, I just want you to know that you can buy Soul pretty much on most platforms now. It was just recently added uh, support to, for Coinbase Wallet back in March. Um, but as of right now, you can buy it on most major centralized exchanges or sexes. And you can swap for it. Um, but yeah, you do need a specific wallet for the Solana ecosystem. Solana does not work with MetaMask. You may not put your Solana in a MetaMask wallet. I know it stinks, but you have to have a separate wallet. The most common wallet that I use is the Phantom wallet, which I'll show you right here if you're looking at my screen. I can see I can add tokens just like I could in MetaMask. I actually have a few extras that just are, I'm not showing. But what's really cool about the Phantom wallet that is not true about the MetaMask wallet is that I can actually see my NFTs right in browser, right in the, um, in the wallet itself. I do not have to go to, to any secondary market in order to see my NFTs. I can actually get a good visual of my blockchain barnyard and also of uh, I believe this is my Mother Urban. So very kind of cool. Can't do this in, in MetaMask yet, but they're working on it for Ethereum. But for Solana, this has been uh, part of Phantom Wallet since day one. The other most common wallet is Soulflare. Uh, I meant to ask at the beginning, can I get a 1 through 10 how many people, uh, is there an Android wallet you recommend for it? So um, I would recommend Phantom or Soulflare. Those are the two most popular. Like I said, Coinbase Wallet, if you already use Coinbase Wallet, did just add support for um, the Solana network. So feel free to use the Coinbase Wallet if you already do. Um, let me check that Phantom is actually on. Yep, Phantom Wallet is on uh, Android. You can install it. It's Phantom Technologies, comma, Inc., Um, and I can install Phantom on my Samsung, but I can't use it in the browser. Use Soulflare. Rebel says use Soulflare. Um, I personally use Phantom. I have heard a lot of people say that Soulflare is a better one. Um, but yeah. Are Soul NFTs compatible with OpenSea or MetaMask? You may not put anything from Solana into a MetaMask wallet. It will not allow you to add the network. MetaMask does not support the Solana network. Currently, this month, OpenSea will add Solana. 
Solana will be integrated onto OpenSea this month, which if you're into Solana NFTs, um, that will be kind of exciting because a whole new group of people that are used to just dealing with Ethereum will now be exposed to much cheaper, cheaper transaction prices. So if you're into Solana NFTs, I would highly recommend looking at listing them on OpenSea when they start up. On PC, I use Phantom. On mobile, I use Soulflare. That's interesting. Hmm. Okay. So you keep your coins in one, and then when you want to transfer them, you just transfer them over. See, that's not a big problem for Solana because you're paying a fraction of a penny for that transfer. So it's not like you have to wait for the gas. No, there's no like real need for a gas tracker, at least yet. Very nice, the swapping master. So it is very important that you do not ever in your life try to send Solana to a MetaMask wallet. You can't do it in the first place, but yes, don't think you can. Don't ever try to do it. Um, I also personally use the Exodus wallet. Oh, Ledger also is a hardware wallet. We've gone over that. Um, they support Solana, so I, I highly recommend. I have seen far, far too many five-figure losses in this space because people don't have a $150 device. A Ledger wallet takes 20 minutes to set up. We're going to have a class on setting up a hard wallet, so if you want to get one and save it for that class, I'm more than happy. We're going to send them out before that, so really really an important thing i want to i want to make sure everybody in this space is staying safe so i highly recommend a ledger hard wallet and i also recommend the exodus wallet especially for you sports people out there um kind of a cool platform they have automatic staking and everything like that so um, you can check out exodus wallet on your own time but i do want to move on to the uh the nft marketplaces on the solana network one of the most popular ones is magic eden Magic Eden was originally um, created by Seed Investment through the Noya Ducks NFT project uh, to create a better NFT marketplace on the Solana blockchain. We can go to my Magic Eden account right now, and you can see it right here. On the left-hand side, we have all different collections. We can see popular ones. I don't know why this is spazzing out. We can see they have a DAO, they have a launch pad, they have games, they have auctions, they have their own calendar on the um, on the DAP or program they're called. On the program, they have their own calendar, which is kind of cool. You don't need to go to nftcalendar.io like you do for um, Ethereum. It's just built right into the platform. So lots of cool stuff on this. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, actually, I'm going to move on. We'll, I'll ask you in a second. But uh, started in April of, uh, uh, starting in April of 2022, again, this month, Magic Eden, which is currently the most popular, will become, in my opinion, the second most popular as OpenSea will take a lot of market share, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your opinion of OpenSea. I know a lot of people call it broken sea. <laughs> Solsi and Solanart are competitors to Magic Eden. Personally, I prefer them. But again, everybody's got an opinion. Uh, these are just more NFT marketplaces where users can buy and sell their NFTs. Solanart was one of the very first and has one of the best reputations out of all of them. But we can go ahead and look at Solsi. This is what I prefer. This is actually one of my NFTs right here. This is Mother Urban. This is Lisa Kalma's very, very first collection. She's an Australian artist. But you would do just like you normally do, connect your wallet. And you can see here that I can go through on SoulScan and I can see view on Solana. I can then see the token itself. I can see the creator's wallet. I can see all the attributes of that token. 
I can see where it was minted from. I could see the total supply. I could see the address of the token, all the transactions that have happened, how much fees were paid. Kind of an added bonus that is not on Etherscan. On Etherscan, you cannot see an NFT, right? But on SoulScan, they have a nice, beautiful visual representation for us, which is kind of cool, in my opinion. And just like on uh, Solana, just like on Ethereum, we have a lot of different other dApps or programs. Uh, again, a dApp is just a decentralized application. Just like on your phone, you've got an application like the Google Play Store, except Google owns the Google Play Store. No one owns these dApps. They, are, um, they have governance tokens. They, they, they are decentralized applications which on Solana are just called programs. The first one I want to talk about is Radium. Radium is an automatic market maker, also called an automated money maker. Um, uh, it's basically just a decentralized exchange, very much like um, PancakeSwap would be on the Binance smart chain. Um, it just allows you to trade your cryptos back and forth. It also allows you to provide liquidity in an LP or a liquidity pool. We're going to talk about that with Crypto Kaplan next week about how you can get sweet percentage gains for doing very little, just providing liquidity to the network. But this next program I want to show you is actually very popular and is used often. So I'm going to encourage us to go ahead and take a deeper look at it. But this is maps.me. It is a mapping and geo-tracking service very similar to Google Maps, except that you can access it online and offline. It has by far the most amount of users out of any other uh, program on Solana. Over 140 million people use it. There's also a built-in crypto wallet and built-in access to DeFi within the program itself. Pretty cool stuff. Maps.me. If you would like right now, please go ahead and try to find it in the Google Play Store. And it will be under capital maps.me Cypress LTD. Got a 4.3 review rating. So if you want to be in Web3 instead of Web2, you can get rid of your Google Maps and start using maps.me. Has anybody ever used this before? Has anybody ever used maps.me before? Nope, no, and nah. <laughs> I love the, <laughs> the variation in your guys' answer of negative. <clears throat> yeah, I will say that I myself uh, am not a big Solana person, so I have not used um, maps.me as often as I should. But in order for tonight, um, I kind of rediscovered it and I downloaded it and I'm going to be using it. So I will give you updates as I go, whether or not it is easier or more difficult than Google Maps. But just to have a... Uh, crypto wallet in there and access to DeFi straight from that wallet. Pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff. A little more advanced than, uh, than Google Maps. All right. And of course, the last thing that we want to look at is the price action. Just like we normally would, we'd look on CoinMarketCap and we can see Solana.com. We can see the white paper, which again, I highly recommend that we start to look and read white papers. And I'm gonna talk about the white paper in a second. Um, and we can look at the different communities, including their Reddit, Twitter, forums, and their Medium articles. But I wanna look more importantly at their price action. As you've seen when things, let's see if we can't find it. 
September. Boom. Right around there is when that first DDoS attack happened. And you can see that people seem to not very much care that there was a lack of security on the network as the price went up $100 to its all-time high. Another almost 50% jump. Since that time, it has crashed back down. And we are now sitting at just above $100 per soul. Soul being the native token on the network. But with layer twos on the Ethereum network and with Ethereum continuing to tease Ethereum 2.0 or beacon chain, as it's called, we're going to see what are called the, the layer one battles. Uh, everybody right now is looking at what will be the Ethereum killer. We're going to have a little bit of a lesson comparing all of them. In my personal belief, it is the Binance Smart Chain. I do believe that BNB will outperform all other layer ones, but I'll give my arguments and tell you my bias on that. Very impressive price action this year, though. One of the big winners of this past year, definitely. Last thing I want to talk about is how does how does Solana get these transaction speeds? While Ethereum right now is proof of work, meaning you need those special mining uh, GPUs or mining ASIC rigs in order to mine the coin and to approve each block and get receive uh, reward from each block, Solana is proof of stake plus a new, more interesting type of consensus mechanism, as it's called. Instead of just proof of stake, they have added another timestamp mechanism called proof of history. In fact, if we look right at the white paper, it is right on page one. The paper proposes a new blockchain architecture based on proof of history or verifying order and passage of time between events. So they have a timestamp and the way that it works is those clusters are approving, they're, they're put in order and they're approving things as they come, which means that they can just barrel through a bunch of transactions and then catch up on them later. They don't need to go one by one by one by one. There was something called the um, Byzantine Fault Tolerance. We can get into that, but that's pretty much um, their innovation in the space is the proof of history consensus mechanism. We've looked at proof of work. We've looked at proof of stake. Proof of history is kind of a new thing. We'll also be looking at NPOS, and there's a couple of other type of consensus mechanisms that are out now that are little less used, but um, when you think of Solana, you should think of proof of stake as well as combined with proof of history, which allows things to be put in order for everybody to catch up on. Very cool blockchain. I will tell you my personal opinions. I do not mean to be negative in any way. I am not a big Solana person. I've never really been a big Solana person. But as we look at all the layer ones, it's important. I'm just telling you my bias. I don't mean to sound negative or like an Ethereum maxi in any way. Um, but as we start to look at all the different layer ones, which these first three are, are three of the main layer ones that we're going to be looking at. Maybe a little bit of Cardano. Polkadot's a layer zero. And Tron is just uh, something totally different. <laughs> we probably won't talk that much about Tron. Uh, but as we look at these layer ones, we're really, in a sense, just looking at what is going to perform the best from here on out. Whereas Ethereum might be the king there's not as much room to grow as there might be on the Binance Smart Chain or on Solana. Another example of a layer one would be Avalanche or AVAX, which we will have a full lesson on next week. So do I have any questions in the chat about anything 
Is that like a credit history? Um, not really. It's more like a transaction history, like Matthew said. So they're just keeping things in order of time, showing which one should go first. Just like getting your ticket at the deli, the validators can then go one by one through things as they should, as they appeared on the network, rather than having to keep up with the network itself, which slows everything down. This also makes it, again, a more susceptible to DDoS attacks. So you can overload the network and pile up too many transactions and the validators won't be able to keep up and bada bing, bada boom, you've crashed the network. In one case for 17 hours, like we saw on September 21st. In another case, uh, it was down for about eight hours and it was like all hands on deck panic mode. Um, I've also seen that they have light downs or um, the network goes off for uh, uh, what do they call it partial outages which is even more concerning that they're not like you know <laughs> if the network's down the network's down so partial outages is a weird kind of thing to me but um, we can see that in January when price action was near highs that problems arose January and that's when the fall really started to happen so as more and more people pile on to the network the network itself becomes less secure and less susceptible and more susceptible to those DDoS attacks they are trying to incentivize um, smaller we can take a look back at um, Solana Beach and we can look at the validators and we can see the super minority of 21 validator clusters out of the total of 17,000 validators and we can see that some of them if I go to stake right here and I look at the lowest amount that's been staked Solana Beach takes a, takes a minute by the way the API is not good. But you can see that here, for example, the validators are all of these different exchanges, these different protocols, these different DeFi platforms, P2P.org, um, Block Daemon, uh, Jump Crypto, Staking Facilities, Kraken is a huge exchange. Um, but we can see that they all have uh, you know, larger stakes. As we get into these smaller stakes, it's literally just wallet addresses. There we go, took forever. But yeah, we could literally see, well, these are zero, but we can see that these are just wallet addresses in some parts. Here's a wallet, here's a wallet. We can tell how long those wallets have been offline for. And again, they're getting 0%. So again, Solana Beach is a much more in-depth look at, to, at each validator uh, on the network. But... Yeah, is that a short way of answering your, your questions? My Solana is staked with Block Daemon. Nice, no problems. Yeah, Block Daemon is huge in the Solana ecosystem. Do you think planned outages could happen with a flood to the network? Um, no, it is not in the best interest of Solana for their network to go down. They want 100% uptime. 100% uptime is very crucial into having a good layer one. Imagine if you were to put, I don't know, the stock market on a layer one blockchain. If that were to go down, it would cause a global financial crisis. You don't want that. So they have, I will give it to Solana Labs, they have addressed all issues immediately when they happen. There is no like backpedaling. There is no um, excuses made. There's just attempt to fix. Yeah, NFT crypto never stops. It's 24 hours, 365 worldwide. When we go to bed, the blockchain's still running. Other, par other countries around the world are using it. So... To have outages on your network is probably one of the, the worst things that could happen. 
aside from maybe like a hack, but even hacks, uh, which by the way, Solana did have a hack. One of its main bridges was hacked, the wormhole bridge. Uh, the venture capital firm that built that bridge actually then um, totally made Solana whole again. All the missing uh, Ethereum that was stolen is actually Ethereum that was stolen. It's uh, from the bridge itself. But bridging Solana to Ethereum, they used what's called the wormhole bridge. And hackers were able to falsify the amount of Solana that was being put in and just take the Ethereum and then transfer the Ethereum out. And so there was a last loss of Ethereum. And the venture capital firm, it was about $320 million at the time. I don't know what that is in modern or in current prices, but it's about $320 million. Happened about a month ago. Um, so again, Solana is, is very, very good for speed, very, very good for low transactions. But when it comes to security, you are sacrificing. There's what's called, you know, the, the we, Crypto Ralphie went over the trilemma. Of, uh, it is considered, Solana is considered more centralized. Um, that those lower validators, I mean, we're looking right now at the number of validators. That That's validator clusters. Like we own over those clusters. Um, they're grouped in a, 150 uh, validators per cluster. And we can see it as a super minority of 21. Which a super minority, by the way, is just the 33%. Let's see where uh, it was back here. This is the super, whoop. This is the super minority right here of those validators that we all looked at before. Everstake, Chorus One, Kraken, Staking Facilities, Jump Crypto, Bison Trails, Figment, Soul Community, Shinobi Systems, P2P, Block Logic, and Block Daemon. And these are all wallets. So these are individuals. But this is the super minority right here. So all it would take would be all these people to get together and say, hey, you want to run game? Which wouldn't happen, but <laughs> it is considered much more centralized and much more susceptible to attacks. Yes, definition of a trilemma. Uh, so you have decentralization, security, and speed it's like my old boss used to say you can have two out of the three you can either have it fast and cheap cheap and good good and fast can't have all three that is the the blockchain trilemma although we're going to take a look at avalanche and how they attempt to solve that we're going to take a look at how ethereum 2 or beacon chain attempts to solve that i shouldn't talk about Ethereum during a Solana lesson, but I will say that uh, Beacon Chain will actually not be a single blockchain. Ethereum will no longer be a single blockchain. Ethereum will be a blockchain that will be sharded through 64 other side chains. Yes, it will be multi-chain. Exactly. And that concept is, is very cool to me. Um, but we'll talk about sharding and what that means. That's just how you split up the information and divide it to receive it at, from one node to the next node, from one point to the next point. But no, not sharding, sharding. <laughs> you guys are too funny. All right, so um, I, you guys can tell personally what my opinions are on things. I do not mean to, I just want to expose my own bias. Um, when it comes to Solana, um, I do think that all layer ones will do well as we continue through the next phase of the bull run. Uh, I do not believe that Solana is the end all be all that a lot of people do. There, you know, it is important to diversify. You saw I have a couple of wallets. I've got a couple of soul that I've been holding on to. Um, I'm not selling anytime soon. Those are things that I'm just holding on to. It is important to diversify in case any of these are winners. But for me, Solana is 
too insecure and not enough of the big action happens on Solana. <laughs> you guys are too funny. All right. Any other questions about the Solana ecosystem? One through one through ten in chat. Please be honest. Who is going to download Maps.me? I literally went to school for seven years. Two undergraduates and a master's. And all I got was three pieces of paper. <laughs> Might not download maps.me. Okay. Thank you for your honesty. I like the concept, but I'll let it be hashed out a bit. It does seem like Solana is in its early days. It might seem like that from the outside, but the network itself is pretty solid at this point. There are major devs that are building. Um, yeah, it's got a little directional arrow. It, yeah. <coughs> I also noticed that uh, it's not, it doesn't, the Google Voice, I can't get my Google Voice to automatically give me directions using maps.me. It won't set it as the preference. It'll keep going to Google Maps instead. They try to keep it in-house. Yeah, and Waze is better anyway because it shows you... Yeah, speed traps, exactly. Exactly. Um, but I would highly recommend that we're going to actually have a class on automatic market makers... Um, and different ones you use. Like I said, Crypto Aaron will be here next week to go over the different wallets and exchanges. Once we get through that content, we'll be able to really start to look at some of these DeFi protocols and how you can provide liquidity um, to, to make percentage gains in your crypto, right? Forget about what the you know value of that is back to the American dollar. The real name of the game is how do you get more crypto without buying more crypto? How can you use your crypto to get more crypto for you? Let your money make money for you. So we're going to get more and more into that. Radium is just one of the options on Solana. Solana seems to have like four options for everything, whether it be NFT marketplaces where you've got Magic Eden and SoulSea and Solanart um, for the AMMs on Solana. You've got Orca, you've got Serum, you've got Radium, all very similar, all have different APY percentage yield for our um, LPs that you can put your money into. So we'll take a look at what the best options available to you are and how you can determine those options for yourself in the future in case things change. Because again, we want to be our own shepherds not just be sheep that see good numbers and put all our money in. That's how you get time wonderland situations. All right. Do I have any other questions? Yes. Beware of the five-figure APR. I once drove three hours each way to get White Castle for the first time. Dr. K, I think I need to put you in the special chair in class. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. I love the super, super troopers. <laughs> I love the special chair. Very nice. All right. So we now have gotten down two of our layer one solution. Uh, sorry, layer one blockchains, which again, layer one blockchains, just think of them as blockchains. They don't sit under the blockchains like a layer zero would, connecting all of the blockchains in different hubs like poly or like uh, Polkadot or Cosmos Hub do instead or then and they don't sit on top like a layer two solution would like Polygon sits on top of the highway that is the Ethereum highway making things cheaper um, putting those everything you know all the transactions on a layer two get put into packets those packets then get put into one transaction in one of the blocks on the layer one they use either ZK roll-up technology, Arbitrum uses Optimistic. We'll get into layer twos. But we're going to keep working our way through layer ones 
really get a good understanding of the layer one war as to which one will be the Ethereum killer or whether Ethereum will continue to reign supreme. And then we'll get into layer zeros and then we'll get into layer twos and then we'll get into some real degen small caps. All right, any last minute questions? Kind of a shorter class tonight. We're ending about 10 minutes early. I'm down to take any questions at all. Any questions, personal questions, finance questions. I teach music. Yep, I have my master's in music education. And yes, it's teach is a very light. If you've ever seen um, School of Rock, that's kind of my job, except I don't kidnap children. I always send them home at the end of the day. But what's better, AVAX or Soul? Solana is much easier to use. AVAX is not user friendly. We're gonna when it comes to the AVAX lesson, you guys are gonna have to roll up your sleeves and get on on computer with me, and I'm gonna need everybody. Yeah. AVAX has C chain. So AVAX has three different chains that you have to actually know about in order to know what you're doing. Like it's not <laughs> as user friendly. It's not like Solana where it's just one chain that you're just, okay, I'm on the Solana network. Yay. I've got a wallet. I just send stuff. So um, you're not hardcore unless you live hardcore. I love that, Matthew. They do have a ton of DeFi dApps though. The ecosystem is flourishing even post Ohm forks. What Time Wonderland was a fork of Ohm, um, which is on AVAX. And yeah, Avalanche has a very, very cool history as well. Um, I don't want to get into it as much, but uh, it's a college professor that just kind of was like experimenting with his grad class. I was like, hey, you guys want to build a layer one blockchain? <laughs> They're like, yeah, that sounds fun. Uh, just to let you know, Anatoly is uh, Ukrainian. Uh, he moved, I believe, to New York City. I, I, I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, with his mother, uh, I want to say in his early 20s. Incredibly bright. If you ever listen to an interview with him, it's, uh, you know, indicative of, of how much of a difference my IQ is between his. <laughs> But yes, Happy Meal, if you would like, I would totally be willing to have you take over that avalanche lesson if you use it. I do not use it very often. I think literally twice maybe in my life. But I will say even after the Ohm Forks failed... Nice, you really like the Avalanche. You really into AVAX. Nice. I will say after uh Yeah, if you guys want to talk, you're welcome to uh to share your experiences with Solana or with uh, any layer ones, what you think is going to win. Um but I will say that uh after the Ohm forks, there were a ton a ton of different Ohm forks, not just Time Wonderland, and pretty much all of them have gone away at this point. The concept of an unpegged stable coin or a stable coin that is pegged to the native currency, not to the fiat currency. It's pegged to the value of the native token. So an unpegged stable coin on Avalanche would be pegged to the price of Avalanche. It would not be pegged to the American dollar. That concept never got through my thick skull. I never ever believed in Ohm. I never I, I called out Ohm forks from day one saying if it's if it's something I can't have explained to me, I'm pretty deep in this space. And if I can't understand it, then it's something I don't think I'm going to personally be investing in. And lo and behold, I'm not tooting my own horn here. I'm just saying that that's a really good kind of way to think about things. If you can't understand what the point of it is, then chances are you don't really want to deal with it. Rude. The idea though, was interesting because now we see inflation go crazy and the idea behind not tying something to something that's so inflationary, it's it, it was a pipe dream. If one day we can do something like that where the currency that it's pegged to 
rises faster than the dollar because it's more stable than the dollar. I mean, the dollar will keep getting more and more volatile as we go on because we keep printing money. Um, but but yes, the concept was a was ideal and utopian, and the uh, execution was failed. Altered. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And and it's interesting to see – I have two thoughts on that. It's interesting to see that Terra Luna is um, somewhat pegging to the price of Bitcoin. I can understand that as Bitcoin's market cap and, and is a little bit more stable and a little bit you know better track record, I would say. Um, but my second thought is when it comes to the inflation of the American dollar, um, I know that a lot of – People right now are saying that it's somewhere around 9%. Um, so, again, wouldn't you know recommend taking out any government bonds at this time. But from what I have seen, it should be closer to about 14%. And if we look at the year 2021, every minute, every minute, $222,000 was printed on order of the Federal Reserve by the United States Treasury. So if you think this is the end of inflation and this is the worst it can get, you are wrong, factually. It will get worse. Right now, you, just to get into a very brief introduction to DeFi, I've just put out a TikTok today you can go look at, but um, Midas Investments will give you about 20% on all stable coins. So at least you're beating inflation with that. Voyager app is much easier to use. They have terrible customer service. VGX is their native token. But the Voyager app will give you 9% on your USDC. And they'll send you a debit card in the mail. You can use to pay at the pump. Automatic transfer from USDC, US dollar coin, into fiat. Yeah, 20% is better than indexes. I'm trying to explain this to one of my friends who works so hard as a day trader in the stock market. And I'm like, dude, you could do better. Just set it and forget it. <laughs> you know, you're making 15% in a good year. <laughs> you could just get a stable coin and <laughs> get, do better. But um, Midas you know, investments. That's, that's actually kind of funny because I, before I started getting into uh, NFT and crypto, I really thought about getting into the stock mar market and options trading. And I did a bunch of research and then I decided to do crypto and NFT instead. Yeah, much, much better to get into emerging markets than it is to try to fight against hedge funds. I'm happy to take hedge fund money all day long and... I wasn't extremely successful when I was doing a little bit of that during my college days, um, but crypto. Oh, nice, Lolly. Crypto to me is now. What's interesting is if you can take your again those liquidity pools that we talked about. So you can take your USDC and stonks. Very nice, <laughs> with the dash dash token behind it, dash coin. Uh, but you could take your USDC and put it into a liquidity pool. And that's when you're starting to earn those large APYs, but it's not Ponzi-nomics. You're literally just providing liquidity. You do have to worry about impermanent loss. We're going to have a whole nother lesson on that, whether or not it's best to just hold the asset. Um, basically, as the price of the asset goes up, if you've got a, a two different pools that you filled up, you know, literal pools of water, uh, on the left pool, you've got, say, for example, your pancake. And on your right pool, you've got your USDC. Well, if the price of pancake surges way up, you're going to miss out if you had just filled that entire pool of cake. So, yes, impermanent loss. We're going to talk about that. That's just specifically for LP pools. Or uh, LPs, liquidity pools. ATM machines. Yeah, pretty much. They're a yeah, it's vending machines for. No, you just said uh, LP pools, and I was just thinking about how many people say ATM machines. Mach uh. The M in ATM is machine. <laughs> yeah, you got to say it three times. ATM machine machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, staking ETH two point oh on the Beacon Chain, you only get seven point five percent. Um, so. 
Again, you're not beating inflation with that, but the name of the game is to get more of the um, asset itself, right? Because the bet that you're making essentially is that Ethereum will become more valuable over time, so you want more of Ethereum. Where did you say you get 20% on USDT? USDT. That's none of your business. Don't, <laughs> don't tell them. <laughs> it's called Midas Investments. Um, they've been around since 2018. I will say that the SEC has pretty aggressively gone after it. That's a lending pool, which is different than a liquidity pool. They're not using you as liquidity to back the network. They're literally using your funds and then lending them out. Um, it's a bank. As a bank. You're pretty much banking yourself through a protocol, right? Except instead of a bank giving you 0 .001 to you know, give some guy a mortgage. That's not exactly how it works, but you can think of it that way. Um, but instead of doing that, there's no, you know, actual infrastructure that needs to be built. There's no employees that need to be paid. There's no bank presidents that need to buy new yachts. So you get all of that percentage. I will say, so the SEC has gone very hard after BlockFi and after Celsius. And it looks like the next one on the hit list is going to be Nexo. Those are all um, lending pools or lending protocols. Um, I actually really wanted to teach you guys about Celsius because that is the basic like dip your toe in the water of I get paid an extra 20, 30 bucks worth of Bitcoin every week just for having my Bitcoin in a Celsius account rather than in a Coinbase account. But unfortunately, the SEC this past month has gone after Celsius. And as of this past Friday, you are not allowed, no new customers that are not accredited investors, if you didn't make more than $200,000 last year, um, are allowed to create new accounts. So right now, Midas Investment is accepting new customers. They've been around for forever. I think it's very important that we repeat the phrase, not your keys, not your coins. Midas has never been hacked. They've never lost customer funds or client funds, I should say. But that's that past uh, performance does not indic is not indicative of future performance. So not your keys, not your coins. If you really, 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 really want to be Secure, the best thing to do is lock it up. Yeah, March 31st, KYC is already on Midas. You do have to do KYC on Midas. Everything now with when it comes, unless you're on a, a DEX, unless you're providing liquidity pools on a DEX through a hot wallet, through KuCoin. Yeah, no, it's April, my guy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, pretty much everything now is KYC. They shut down Gate.io. Gate.io is no longer available to Americans. That used to be non-KYC. The only place you can go now that's non-KYC is KuCoin, as long as you have not verified. If you verified on KuCoin, then you're kind of screwed. I think that's going to become common practice. I don't think there's going to be too many more <clears throat> decentralized uh, places, exchanges. When it comes to centralized exchanges, I agree. I think a lot of them will be KYC. I think as we get in deeper into the space and more people are aware of what's going on, um, not only with tax regulations and what the government is then using that tax revenue for, I think a lot more people will start using decentralized exchanges. In my mind, it's right now we're at the AOL dial-up era. And when we get into the Yahoo era, a lot more people feel much more comfortable like, oh, this is a little bit easier. And then when, when you know Google takes over and the user interface is beautiful and any squirrel can figure out how to do a Google search, when we get into that era, I think decentralized exchanges will reign supreme. Mm -hmm. That's when That's we'll fair. be taken off with all our millions or billions and everybody will be thinking, man, I wish I'd have gotten into crypto. Just like, man, I wish I'd have gotten into the dot coms. Right? <laughs> oh, sure. Right? Well I'll, well, I'll move to Satoshi Island. If you guys haven't heard, they're building a, mm -hmm. a new society. 
that is just for uh, crypto. It's nah, cool. I'm good. No, you don't want to move to Satoshi Island? No. You know where I want to go? I'd rather go to uh, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, uh, Finland, anything over there. Yeah. Go to the Nordic. It's nice and cold. Okay, yeah. Some salmon. Date some women. It was good beer. Yeah, they got good beer there. I like the, I like the. well, I've been, but uh, I know several people over there, and um I like the seasons. I like the culture. I like the days a week. I like the uh, the work hours. I like the better pay. I like the. I mean, obviously you're taxed quite a bit more, but a lot more is taken care of for you, and the money seems to be put to better use than it is here. What about the skiing, man? Are you kidding me? And all the, in Switzerland, also, you know, they drink all their wine. They don't export us a, a little drop of wine. Uh, you can't <laughs> find this wine in America if you try. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I didn't think about that. Not to mention you can get a Swiss bank account. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I don't know. I that's, yeah, those those are the places that I would probably go. Isn't it nearly uh, impossible to get Europe. a Swiss um, citizenship, though? So here's, here's the thing. If you have... Because uh, I've looked into this, by the way. <laughs> um, if you have a, a, skill, a trade skill... You can almost always get a uh, a work visa, and as long as you have a certain amount of hours, you can then get citizenship. Into Switzerland, really? Yeah, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, all those places. Like uh, in that cluster, you can you can pretty much guarantee that you can get Swiss, uh, citizenship just by uh, like, and it's hard labor jobs and and things of that nature. But I happen to have a background in construction, um, and my wife is. A nurse so we could move there in a heartbeat what about solidity engineers <laughs> <laughs> maybe one day maybe one day no if you want if you want to be yeah, that's solid- that's probably where i would go if, if, you want I, to be if a I had to choose a place. solidity engineer the united states is where you want to be the price is right here. for now the, yeah oh, the price is right in the united states right now yeah they have all of these like um, Golden Boy Solidity Engineers coming out of Japan right now, and it's very difficult to hire them because their English is so bad, and most of the time that they're, they're building contracts for NFT projects, so you want the dev to be able to talk to the community, and to have that language barrier is a very big hurdle to overcome. And they're geniuses. I've seen some full stack devs coming out of Japan that are like you know, seven day turnarounds on mint sites, contract builds, dynamic mints, like incredible, incredible work ethics and all testing done all within seven days. And you're like, wow, you know, and and then you try to get through the rest of the conversation and it's like, we need a translator. (laughs) Have you, have you personally written any contracts, Sean? No, no, nope. I, I mean, did. I know you know a bunch about it, but I was just I was just wondering if you've like uh, tried to deploy anything yet. Nope. Uh, I did audit one and am currently – I actually wanted to talk oh, – I was going to do uh, intro to DeFi tonight, um, but we're going to wait for Crypto Kaplan to uh, finish up with his exams this week and get into it next week. But I did audit um, Alpha Tournament and um, did expose them. They – are doing their transactions off chain. They have some send functions that don't make sense. And then they're mining their token, which is an ERC 20. And there is no actual contract for that token, which means they're making it up and they're charging Interesting. fees in order to make it up. And those fees don't make sense. So. Did you follow the uh, NBA NFT? No, I did I? not. Tell me about it. Okay, so Rebel, who was in here uh, a little bit earlier and said that they uh, had to get back to work, but they really enjoyed the class, um, was here for the Jingle Egg Jones class, um, and of course, Joss's Red Flag class. And I actually learned a couple of things in those classes that I hadn't really thought of before, uh, one of which being 